Hi, I'm Dan Reznicek, a urologist in Bellingham, Washington, and today I'm going to be discussing penile augmentation. That's right, penile enlargement surgery. It's a growing topic. The reason I'm going to talk about this today is there have been a significant amount of marketing about the surgeries lately due to a new silicone sleeve implant. I've had a number of patients come in and ask me about the procedure. Further, the more I look into it, the more articles I find being written about the device in popular magazines and online blogs from Huffington Post to Women's Health to Cosmopolitan. These articles talk about how the procedure has helped men with small penises increase the length and girth of their penis. They mention that there's a simple surgical fix for a small penis. Most of these reference this new, specific FDA cleared device. Interestingly, as these non-medical articles talk about the benefits of the procedure, both the American Urological Association and the International Society for Sexual Medicine both consider penile augmentation surgery experimental and has no proven benefit. No reputable urological society considers penile enlargement surgery safe and efficacious. How are these magazine articles claiming there is an easy fix and the urological community claims that these are potentially dangerous procedures without any proven benefit? This deserves a deeper dive. Let's investigate. What we're going to cover today. Number one, what is a normal penis size? This is important when we talk about penile augmentation surgery and why people are having it done. Two, what are the various non-surgical treatments available? And three, what are the various historical surgical treatments? And then four, what is the new silicone sleeve implant that was recently released? We're going to look into the science that's presented on the device and see why it may not be exactly as advertised. Then we're going to look into the actual risks of the procedure, not just what's reported in the marketing. But to start off the discussion, it's important to note, why are men having this done? Men in our society clearly place a significance on their manhood, and size is very important to men. It's part of their masculinity. No man wants to hear that they have a small penis. But, but what is a normal penis size? Why do some men feel inadequate? I think what's fascinating here is that studies have shown that most men who get penile enlargement surgery have a totally normal penile size. So they're going through all the risks of the procedure and what they don't understand is they're normal. Why are they getting surgery again? First, the all important question. What is an average penis size? Lucky for our society, there have been many scientific studies examining the average length of a man's penis. We can thank the long, hard hours put in by these researchers to get these measurements. Rather than try to fight cures for diseases such as Ebola, cancer, or heart disease, some scientists are not afraid to spend the hours on and examining measuring penises. But when contemplating measuring a penis, researchers have measured both the flaccid penis and the erect penis and looked into which ones are more accurate. Measuring the flaccid penis, the non-erect state, is actually a bit hard to do. Just like George from Seinfeld demonstrated after a cold swim in the classic shrinkage episode, the human penis length can change significantly between cold and warm temperatures and between flaccid and aroused states. Measuring the same penis in different temperatures or different situations when it's non-erect may lead to very different measurements. So a flaccid penile measurement is really not that helpful for scientific comparisons. Furthermore, as it turns out, scientific studies have shown that flaccid penile length and girth is a poor predictor of erect penile length and girth, proving there is some truth when your friend states, I'm a grower, not a shower. Rather than measure the soft penis, researchers tend to use either a stretched penile length, pulling the penis on stretched when non-erect, or by measuring an erect penis. Both of these measurements have a much better correlation with time. So back to our question, what is a normal penis si size? As discussed before, there are many studies that look into this, 
Of the studies listed, the average length of an erect penis is somewhere between 13 and 16 centimeters, or 5 and 6 inches erect, and a flaccid length is about 5 to 6 centimeters shorter than the erect length, or about 2 to 3 inches. Men actually tend to underestimate their own penile size. Several studies have been entirely devoted to this, and there's even a coined term, small penis syndrome, for men with normal penile size who feel that theirs is small compared to others. For some men, this can become an obsession or a disorder, and in that case, the term, the medical term for this is penile dysmorphic disorder, or PDD. This is a subtype of body dysmorphic disorder. These men have a normal penile size and have anxiety and impairment in various areas of functioning due to their perceived small penis. Truly small penis size is known medically as a micropenis. This is a phallus with an erect length of less than 7.5 centimeters or about 3 inches in length. This video is not devoted to a discussion about micropenis because most men undergoing surgery for penile augmentation have a normal penile size. Kevin Wiley investigated men with a perceived small penis and found that most men had developed their perception in childhood when their penis was small, but at that time, they were comparing themselves to an older brother or father. Even though it's not a clearly valid comparison and it grew as they aged, this early visualization led some men to think for the rest of their lives they had a small penis. These men were afraid to expose themselves in locker room settings and would avoid some sexual encounters due to this fear. A smaller proportion of men in those studies were found to be comparing their penis to those seen in pornographic material and were dissatisfied. In fact, many of the men studied and treated were also comparing their penile size to other men by looking down at themselves while naked. While looking down at yourself creates a perception of a small size, one of the treatments that was actually suggested and helpful in these studies was men literally standing in front of a full-length mirror while naked looking at their own penis because it looks larger than when looking at it from above. Normal men commonly believe that they have an inadequate penile length. A study of over 52,000 heterosexual couples found that a shocking 55% of men were not satisfied with their penile size. Interestingly, in the same study, only one in eight of the women were not satisfied with their partner size. The majority of men who seek out treatments for penile augmentation and enlargement, in fact, have normal sizes, as I've mentioned before. Further, these studies that show when talking to partners, the importance placed on penile size and mate choice is incredibly low. Only one in eight partners were dissatisfied. Despite these facts, some men who are even shown these still suffer from intense feelings of shame and embarrassment, and it does affect their quality of lives and their relationships. Again, the primary treatment should be psychological with psychotherapy. Men with a normal size and happy partners should be avoiding surgeries and treatments that have real potential harm. However, some men still seek them out. So let's go over what the treatments are and what are the risks of those procedures. In order to understand the treatments, though, we have to have a basic understanding of penile anatomy. First, the penis as a structure has two main functional pieces, the erectile bodies and the urethra. The erectile bodies are known as the corpora cavernosa. These twin structures lie on top of the penis, and there's one on each side. They're filled with spongy tissue that fills with blood when aroused. The lining of the tubes, when filled, becomes inelastic. You can liken them to a fire hose. When the fluid fills the fire hose with enough pressure, the hose becomes stiff. The urethra and penile glands the head of the penis, have a similar filling to the corpora with that spongy tissue, but they lack that inelastic outer layer. They remain fairly spongy even during an erection. Outside of these two parts, the corpora cavernosa, the erect tissue, and the urethra, the only other parts of the penis are a small layer of arteries and nerves on the top, and then skin. There really isn't a whole lot else there. The penis, unlike much of the rest of the body, does not have a layer of fat or exterior muscle. Most of the procedures we're going to talk about add tissue or substance 
outside the erectile bodies and below the skin. So next, let's go into the treatments. First, drugs and supplements, non-surgical therapies. You may have seen these on online advertisements or in a supplement store. These products increase your girth and length. For drugs and nutraceuticals, there is zero scientific evidence that any of these work. Does it make sense that taking a drug or herb can make a specific body part grow larger? Are there drugs that make your nose or fingers bigger? No. If something sounds too good to be true, it probably is. The second non-surgical treatment would be exercises. I've heard a lot of this from patients looking in online forums about penile stretching and exercises that might increase penile length. Again, does this make any sense at all? Even if pulling on the penis stretched out would somehow expand the corpora cavernosum, it would not magically build more healthy, spongy tissue on the inside, and it certainly would not increase the girth. There's no scientific basis for these studies. We don't put short people in traction devices and expect them to grow taller. However, if you were to do these things, there, again, is a real potential for harm that can cause penile injury. Too much pressure or pulling on the penis creates tension on the nerves and tissues and can cause numbness or um, damage to the arteries itself. I have treated one young man with permanent erectile dysfunction who was trying jelking at home because he read it online that it would increase his penile length. These things do happen. So number three, I'll mention clamps, rings, or traction devices. Again, in terms of penile lengthening in normal men, there's no evidence that they work. There are some studies that show evidence of use in Peyronie's disease. This is a disease that causes scar tissue and penile curvature and shortening. The benefits are fairly modest, and the devices required to work have to be used for multiple hours in a day, which is really hard to do. And the mod modest benefit has to be weighed with the risks of using these devices for a long period of time. Again, long-term pressure injuries can lead to nerve damage or skin injuries. Uh, number four, vacuums or penile pumps. This is the Austin Powers Swedish Penis Enlarger. These can be used for the treatment of erectile dysfunction, and there's no data to support their use in penile enlargement. But next, let's go on to surgeries. It's very important to talk about these historically first, as some men have done incredibly dangerous things to their penis to try to make it larger over the years. The first and most common form of penile augmentation were penile injections. Men were injecting themselves with a variety of substances that we're going to cover next. These injections were placed in the area above the erectile bodies, but below the skin. This would add girth around the penis when it's erect, but would not make the erect portion of the penis any larger. This adds a soft, cushy layer above the firm erection, with bo which both looks odd and feels odd to anyone who examines the penis, because again, there's not usually any fat or soft tissue above the erect portion of the penis when fully rigid. So here's what it would look like in general when successful. The shaft of the penis is much thicker and wider than the glands. It's definitely an odd look. In terms of injections, the use of silicone was by and large the most common early on. Silicone became popular for cosmetic augmentation in the 1960s. Early injections were disastrous and had horrible compl complications, including death. Much of this data was in terms outside penile augmentation, but some of it is. Silicone is a polymer that's made up of silicone atoms and oxygen atoms combined with several other elements. There are many, many types of silicone. They're heat resistant and can be liquid or rubber-like. They contain a variety of other chemicals or contaminants, especially industrial silicone. Silicone was first injected for breast enlargement and butt enlargement therapy. Early experience demonstrated the ability for liquid silico silicone to migrate or to move after it was implanted. This led to poor cosmetic results because the original area became flattened or got lumpy, but it could also be incredibly dangerous as sometimes the silicone traveled to important other vital organs. This could happen years after the injection. 
and depending what was mixed with the silicone, the particles would cause an intense inflammatory reaction. Originally, they were doing this on purpose to prevent the silicone from migrating, but they found that it led to intense scarring and inflammation years down the road. Given the terrible results that happened, it was actually banned for injection in the U.S. in the 1970s. There's still some being performed today illegally here in the U.S. and much more commonly internationally. I would highly, highly, highly recommend against this as a treatment. Reports of the reactions to the injections are terrible. You can look them up online, but they include severe swelling, penile distortion from the inflammation, and erectile dysfunction. Some of the side effects did not occur for up to 30 years after injection. Since liquid injections were disastrous, plastic surgeons then developed a soft, um, solid silicone implant. This prevented the problems with migration. These have been used now in reconstructive surgery for years with muscle or breast augmentation, and the newer silicone is much more safe than it was in the past. Recently, it's been incorporated into penile augmentation, which we're going to cover here shortly. Other soft tissue fillers of the penis are still quite common. Out, other soft tissue fillers outside of silicone are still quite common. Their overall use in the U.S. in plastic surgery overall has increased by 300% since the year 2000. Some of these other fillers include hyaluronic acid, calcium hydroxylapatate, collagen, PMMA, several others. They're used for countless types of minimally invasive cosmetic procedures and have been examined for use in penile augmentation. Some of these have very well-established safety profiles and can be FDA-approved for dermal injections. Hyaluronic acid has been shown to increase girth in some studies and increase circumference by over 3 centimeters. The problem with these fillers, again, is they're adding a soft layer above the penis. This makes the erection feel less firm than before and unnatural when erect. And years down the road, there can be some movement of the filler resulting in ridges or bumps. I've seen men come in years later who have a penis that looks like bubble wrap under the skin and want it removed. Other fillers can potentially have hypersensitivity reactions with scarring and inflammation that may result uh, with complex surgical removal. Another common injection under the penis is fat. A patient's own fat has been used for cosmetic purposes for many, many years. Liposuction is performed first to harvest the fat, and then it's injected into another area of the body, and in this case, the penis. As you can imagine in the penis, this does not affect the length, but only adds girth and really is only adding soft girth around the erection. These fat cells have to develop a blood supply and take in the tissue where they're in place. This often happens irregularly and again can have a lumpy appearance to the penis after the injections. Additionally, a somewhat strange side effect of this is that when a patient gains weight, later on, the fat cells can also grow significantly. So 20 years down the road, if you're to gain 20 pounds, the fat cells in the penis also start to gain weight, and it starts to gain a significant amount of fat. But on a serious note, these can also be very dangerous and deadly. There is a report of a healthy 30-year-old male dying from a fat injection because the fat was accidentally injected into a vein resulting in a fat embolism that traveled to his lungs. This is a very rare result, but it is a potential risk. Overall satisfaction with all penile injections is quite low. This again is due to the non-natural erect state and lumpy appearance. Even if the appearance is not lumpy, they're just adding girth to the non-erect penis. So let's next look at some of the most commonly offered surgeries for penile augmentation. The first surgery is called a suspensory ligament VY-plasty. Let's look at this diagram. This surgery was performed to improve the perceived length of a penis. Many cosmetic surgeons would combine the surgery with an injectable procedure to add some girth. An incision is made above the penis, and the attachment from the penis to the pubic bone is cut. This allows the penis to sit lower on the body and have the appearance that it's longer. It's not actually lengthening the penis, but just allows it to sit lower and more of the penis is able to come outwards. Further, once it's lowered above the penis, there is a very noticeable dent or divot. 
This is a classic sign that someone's had a VY plasty. Risks of the procedure are a poor cosmetic outcome with the above mentioned divot, and sometimes the flap can be too large, causing the penis to be placed in the scrotum. There are several urological papers devoted entirely to reconstructing poor outcomes of this procedure. I should also mention a more extreme form of penile augmentation here briefly, known as penile disassembly or sliding surgeries. These are quite dramatic surgeries that need to be used in combination with a penile implant to work. They are experimental surgeries performed for significant penile shortening that occurred due to prior surgery or disease processes. These are high-risk operations, and complications include severe loss of arterial flow to the penis and glandular necrosis. There are some even reports of entire penile loss from this procedure. So take note before you sign up for one of these. These procedures increase the width and or length of the erectile bodies of the penis. These will actually increase the erection, the firm erection portion of the penis. But the risk is so high because the entire penis is disassembled in the process. It has a large chance of removing the important blood supply and causing necrosis. And furthermore, they can only be done in combination with a penile prosthesis because doing it alone would cause permanent erectile dysfunction. Further, they can't add too much length or girth. Or sorry. Further, they can't add too much length to the penis without causing a problem because the length of the urethra and the nerves are fixed and they will tether. So last, let's talk about this new subcutaneous silicone implant. There's been a lot of coverage in the media, as I mentioned before, this product, as mentioned before, this product has tons of headlines out there, and they're great clickbait. Look here at GQ. Huge news. The bionic dick is here. This headline from Cosmopolitan. Penis implants exist now, and they start at a size large. The New York Post. Two inches changed my life. So what is a silicone implant? How is it different from past products such as fillers or fat injections? So... This implant here is called the Panuma device. It's a soft implant placed above the erectile bodies. It's very similar to injections or fat implants. It does not change the erectile tissues. So it's not going to make the firm part of the penis any bitter, bigger. Again, it's only going to add a soft additional layer to the penis around the erectile tissue. It's going to increase girth. On their website, they report that some patients state increases length, but it does not do that. In their own study where the inventor of the device measured the pre and post procedure lengths, he did not measure length. If there was going to be length improvement, my guess is he would have measured for it. So how is this procedure performed? During the surgery, the penis is exposed through an incision and a piece of silicone is sutured in place between the skin and above the erectile tissue. What are some of the risks reported from this procedure. So per marketing in the one published clinical trial, which we're going to get into here shortly, he reported a 3.3% infection rate, a 4.5% scar rate, and 12 patients who necessitated device removal. The device is a silicone implant, and we know from many other plastic surgery trials that there is risk of silicone use in surgery. Complications common to all silicone implantations can, can occur either early or late and include seroma, hematoma, infection, wound dehiscence, neurovascular injury, implant migration, implant rupture, implant leakage, and capsular contraction. Neural and vascular structures can be injured on the basis of their proximity to the implant. It sounds like this is a great device, and the marketing makes it seem like the FDA has looked at the data and has given it approval for use in penile augmentation. Uh, but that would be a bit misleading. These are marketed as FDA cleared silicone implants for penile augmentation. There is a huge difference between FDA clearance and FDA approval. It's not very obvious, it's very misleading to customers. In fact, this also confuses physicians at times. Dr. Malik's video here 
incorrectly calls this device FDA approved, but it's only FDA cleared. FDA approval requires a lot of work and research. FDA approval means that the FDA has reviewed data on both the non-clinical attributes of the device, such as the chemistry of the device and the shelf life, as well as the clinical attributes of the device. Clinical attributes are clinical trials that test the device on patients, and the trials need to show both safety and efficacy. If the device is found to be both safe and effective, the FDA will approve the device for the specific procedure in which it's indicated. For example, the FDA will approve a pacemaker, but only for its use in the heart and likely only in certain clinical scenarios. However, FDA clearance is a totally different story. In order to get FDA clearance, the device requires submission of a pre-market notification to the FDA to register the device to show that the device is substantially similar to a product that the FDA has already approved. It does not require any safety or efficacy data at all. In the case of this device, you can read about the 501k submitted for the implant here. It was found to be similar enough to a product previously used in the ear, nose, and throat synthetic polymer material. It did not go through the rigorous process of FDA approval to date of this video in 2023. If you want to see a deeper dive into the differences between FDA clearance versus approval and why this is so misleading to consumers, see the John Oliver episode here. So let's look specifically at the paper presented online. The paper is titled, A Single Surgeon Retrospective and Preliminary Evaluation of the Safety and Effectiveness of the Panuma Silicone Sleeve Implant for Elective Cosmetic Correction of the Flaccid Penis. This is a paper written by the patent owner of Panuma, and all the men treated were his patients. 526 patients underwent the placement of the device from 2009 to 2014. Interestingly, only 400 patients are in the study. More on this later. First, let's look at the positives here. They measured changes in penile measurement and changes in self-confidence and satisfaction store scores. Both of these improved in the study. The score is non-validated, which means the data was not tested for validity or reliability, and it may be subject to bias. Regardless, though, he, imports, he reports a big improvement in self-confidence, with less than 2% of men having high or very high self-confidence prior to the procedure, and 72% having high or very high self-confidence in long-term follow-up. He also reports an average circumference increase of the penis from 3.3 inches to 5.2 inches. That's a pretty significant increase. But on the downside, the study shows that the person taking the scores was the author of the study, who's also the creator of the product and has a financial interest. There's a pretty high risk of bias there. Unfortunately, these were not recorded by an independent person. If I were to design a study and test something, I would want to show, if it was successful, that it wasn't me that was measuring it, why it was successful. Additionally, in terms of record keeping, the Medical Board of California also had some questions about the thoroughness of this author's medical record in 2015. What I don't doubt is that this device increases the flaccid penis diameter. It has to when you place a synthetic implant there. But having the creator of the device measure the pre and post procedure circumference probably is not best practice. Remember previously when we talked about how a non-erect penile measurements are incredibly inaccurate and scientifically, if you wanted to measure girth or length, you should measure it either in the erect state or pulling the penis on stretch? Well, this study didn't do that. This study relied entirely on measuring the flaccid penile circumference. So when the penis was not erect, sorry, so when the penis was not erect, the author measured the the length around the penis. This is likely on purpose as the device does not make the erect portion of the penis any bigger. It's just adding padding around it. So when the penis is stretched, that silicone sleeve will also stretch out and thin out. So the biggest improvement from this procedure and width is going to be with a flaccid or non-erect penis. 
the author himself even acknowledged that, as has been reported in other studies, measuring the exact length of a flaccid penis proved to be challenging. Flaccid length was found to be dependent on time of day, environment, and time period following surgery. Yet, he continued to report penile girth the same way. Another interesting point about the lengths reported here, in the paper, the average preoperative circumference was 8.5 centimeters. This is actually in the normal range when looking at other papers, which show an average circumference between 8.5 and 10 centimeters. The author even states, a legitimate query to the study is for whom the procedure is indicated. Many of our patients had a penis that would have been considered normal by statistical standards. The larger portion of patients in this study 84% had not sought counseling help regarding the size of their penis, and most had a penis that was statistically normal before implantation. It is acknowledged that this implant surgery is not recommended therapy suggested by any urological guideline. That's a fairly stunning admission in the paper itself. Most of the men had a normal penis. The medically accepted treatment for this is counseling. Only 16% of these men had counseling, but he still offered them all an implant. But enough about the measurements. The actual bigger problem with this paper is the men that he included in the study. 126 men who were operated on during the study period were not even included in the study. What happened to these men? Were 400 the only ones selected because they had a better outcome? Per the author, all patients were contacted after the fact for consent, and only 400 patients consented to participate. Those that did not were excluded from the study. We have no idea what happened to these men. Did they have fantastic results? Were they catastrophic? We don't really know. This is why when you have a new device or implant, you're supposed to conduct a study in a prospective manner. That way, you include everyone in the results people that sign up in advance of the study, and you follow them to completion. This data in this study is basically unusable because we don't know the complications that happened in the men that were excluded from the study, and we don't know what their satisfaction was. And the number of those men isn't small. It's 25% of the patients. There could be an incredibly high complication rate that we just don't know about. On the flip side, I guess there could be a really high portion of men who are even more satisfied. We just don't know. However, there are some hints from other studies that are published around the same time period that suggest that some of the 126 men excluded from the study did not have great results. In his paper, he writes that no patient developed erectile dysfunction. Only 3% of patients required removal of the device. However, a paper written by authors in Florida and Washington State noted that three patients that had this implant presented to them with fairly significant complications, one of them that included loss of sensation to the head of the penis, another with complete erectile dysfunction requiring a penile prosthesis. Since he reported a 0% erectile dysfunction rate, we can assume that these men were not included in the original study. Yet another paper in 2018 from urologist at UC Irvine, just down the street from Dr. Elist, highlighted a number of patients who had complications after penile augmentation surgery. Four of the complications were specifically from patients with a silicone sleeve implant. Now, they did not name this as the penuma implant. This could be a random coincidence or other implant. I don't know. Regardless, four of those patients required explant of the device, some of them with significant problems afterwards, including severe erectile dysfunction. So, how do we know what the real complication rate is? Well, we don't. While the reported percentage of men having complications is small per the report of the author and founder of the study and the guy who created the device, the true percentage of complications is unknown. Further, some of the outcomes that we do know about were worse than what he reported in the study based on other authors. The last point on why looking at the study is not really that helpful at all is there's no control arm in the study. A control arm is very important because it helps us evaluate what would happen if something else were done instead of this implant. This could be nothing, an alternative procedure, or something that I would suggest in this case, psychological counseling. How many of these men would have been more satisfied six months later had they had appropriate counseling? 
It might even be higher than the number of men who had surgery. And counseling has little or no risk. Unfortunately, we don't know because there's no alternative treatment arm. So that was a lot to cover about penile augmentation. Let's review here shortly. Most men that seek out penile augmentation surgery have a normal penis size. Men with normal penile size can suffer from a perceived sense of small penis and a preoccupation with penile size known as penile dysmorphic disorder. Often, they have a satisfied partner. These men would be best suited with psychological evaluation or medical therapy. For men who, after all the warnings I mentioned above, who are still looking to undergo penile augmentation surgery, you should talk to your surgeon specifically and get educated about the risks and benefits of surgery. Go into some of the things I talked about previously. Also understand that if a device or procedure are performed, is FDA approved or cleared? Because it's a big difference. At the time of this video, there are no FDA approved procedures for genital enlargement. Further, you should also understand that many of the long-term risks of these implants are not known about yet. In terms of breast implants, long-term risks in some situations were only studied 15 to 20 years after the implants were in place. So I would suggest going forward that any genital enlargement procedures should be done in the context of a well-designed clinical trial. These devices may be helpful in some patients in some clinical scenarios. I'm not against silicone implants at all. I think there just needs to be a better designed clinical trial and better follow-up with independent reviews of the efficacy and the complication rates so we can know what to expect. Right now, there's a large black box and some of the data is incredibly misleading. We simply don't have accurate data to show that any of these procedures are safe or have good long-term satisfaction rates. So that's all I have today. Again, Dan Resnicek from Pacific Northwest Urology. I'm sure I'm going to get some interesting comments down below. Um, please like the video, and we'll see you again next time.